We're here live in Washington, D.C. Today, we have not one, but two scientific findings for you about oceans beyond Earth. We'll be going coast to coast and ocean to ocean to talk to experts, starting from people right here in Washington, D.C., and then all, also going all the way to the West Coast to talk to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And then we're going to go all the way to the East Coast to talk to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Today's panelists are Thomas Zerbukin, Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Jim Green, Director of Planetary Science, Mary Wojtek, Lead Scientist for NASA's Astrobiology Program. The panelists at JPL in California are Linda Spilker, Cassini Project Scientist, Hunter Waite, Cassini INMS team lead with the Southwest Research Institute, or SWERI, in San Antonio, Texas. Chris Glein, Cassini INMS team associate, also from SWERI. And joining us from Goddard in Maryland, we have William Sparks, astronomer and lead author of the Hubble findings with the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. The news today can be found at www.nasa.gov and also the following web pages. If you'd like to ask a question via social media, please use the hashtag AskNASA. And with that, Thomas, can you kick us off? Hey, thanks so much, Felicia. It's another great day of science at NASA here. And uh, in the science directorate, we really focus on three objectives. The first one is to understand and to improve life on Earth. We also do fundamental research from here to the depth of the universe and understand processes we've never understood before. And the third topic is one that this is all about, which is about a fundamental question that it has, has filled the th thinking of so many in the past and we can answer now, hopefully in the near future, and that is, is there life elsewhere? See, here on Earth, there's a number of things that help life. There's water in a liquid form. We have an atmosphere, we have a magnetic field that protects us from the hazards of space. There's many things we have going for ourselves. So the question whether there's life out there relates to questions that we're making progress with all the time and questions uh, that we have, new questions that are coming forward. We don't know yet whether there's life out there, but Right now, we're making a lot of progress, especially the outer solar system. So this is exactly what today's stories are all about. With this research, we're making a big step forward towards answering the question, is there life out there? And with that, I'm really turning it over to the team. Go team. Thank you, Thomas. So NASA's strategy for searching for life in the universe begins at home with an understanding of how life emerged and evolved here on Earth and what the limits to life are on this planet. We then project that out onto other places in our solar system to see if we can find habitable environments that could support life as we know it. Just 40 years ago, NASA sent two Viking landers to Mars to look for evidence of life on the red planet. At the same time, oceanographers here on this planet, on Earth, were exploring the last frontier the deep ocean. And during that exploration, they found an astonish or made an astonishing discovery that changed how we thought about Earth and how we thought about life here on Earth. And that was an incredible oasis of life supported thousands of meters beneath the surface of the ocean, far away from sunlight. And it was supported by the energy produced by hydrothermal activity. <coughs> now, this is actually. This discovery was incredible for here on Earth. It led to, but it pointed out a new type of biology supported by chemistry that didn't require sunlight, which me meant that we could extend our habitable in Jupiter. As we imagine environments very much like our own hydrothermal vents here on Earth could exist out there. So today's discoveries have to do with ocean worlds beyond our own planet. And Jim's going to tell you about the missions that brought this to us. You know, it really began in the 
late 1990s with the mission Galileo. Galileo orbiting Jupiter was flying by the individual moons, the Galilean moons, um, making observations of the atmosphere and many things in that solar system, that mini solar system. What it discovered from its magnetometer as it flew real close to Europa was a magnetic signature that's very familiar with our scientists because we interpret it as a current within an ocean underneath an ice shell. In 2005, Cassini orbiting Saturn, flying by the moons of Saturn, with close flybys of Enceladus, it observed huge plumes of water emanating from cracks. We now believe that Enceladus also has a huge ocean. We call these bodies and many others that are like them ocean worlds. They are protected by an ice shell, much like our atmosphere protects us, our life here on Earth, and our ocean maintaining its liquid. This is truly an exciting time for us to be able to probe those and really try to understand what's happening in these ocean worlds. What we're going to talk about today are two really wonderful discoveries. Continuing back to Cassini, which has always been one of the major uh, missions that we have, making a huge number of discoveries. And we're going to talk about Enceladus and what it's found out. We're also going to talk about Hubble observations back to Europa. These two ocean worlds we're going to link together because they're so similar in many, many ways that I hope you'll see as we go through our discoveries today. So without further ado, let's go to JPL and talk to Linda Spilker. Linda, what's Cassini been observing? Well, thanks, Jim. Well, Cassini has been in orbit around Saturn for almost 13 years. And our unexpected discoveries about Enceladus have been some of the most surprising. Today, we're publishing a paper about our recent findings by Cassini on Enceladus. We've detected hydrogen in the plume of Enceladus. That hydrogen is coming from a hydrothermal vent on the seafloor of Enceladus, going out into space through the plume. And so this is a very significant finding because the hydrogen could be a potential source of chemical energy for any microbes that might be in Enceladus's ocean. So this is a very exciting finding for the Cassini team. Now Enceladus is too small to have retained the hydrogen when it formed. And so the hydrogen we see today, the hydrogen gas, is coming from inside Enceladus. So let's take a quick look at some of Cassini's past findings. With this first image, this is a view of the south pole of Enceladus. And the geysers or the jets are coming from those four cracks we nicknamed tiger stripes, those bluish fractures that you can see at the south pole of Enceladus. In the next picture, you can see that these jets are shooting out into space, forming the giant plume around Enceladus. Underneath that icy crust, as Jim said, there's a global ocean. That global ocean sits on top of a rocky core. And some of Cassini's findings pointed to hydrothermal vents, basically hot water coming out after it's been mixed with the rocky core. And this final image shows a thermal map, the temperature of the South Pole. And we can see the warmest temperatures with the yellow and red are right along the tiger stripe fractures. So what's new today? The new finding is finding hydrogen coming from the plume of Enceladus and the fact that it could support potentially microbes with energy on the seafloor of Enceladus. Now, this finding is the result of 12 years of Cassini investigations. And it really represents a capstone finding for the mission, because we now know that Enceladus has almost all of the ingredients that you would need to support life as we know it on Earth. Well, here I have a model of the Cassini spacecraft. And Hunter, maybe you can show us where your instrument is that detected the hydrogen. Yes, Linda. Um, the ion mass instrument, the ion neutral mass spectrometer, is sitting on the fields and particle platform right here and it directly samples the gas that comes in as we fly through the plume, as opposed to an ultraviolet spectrometer, an infrared spectrometer, which would look for scattered, absorbed, or emitted light coming from the molecules in a, in a faraway loca location. So this sampling 
is extremely important for detecting trace species. And we were able to, from previous flybys and previous measurements, find out that the plume is 98% water. It has traces of ammonia, carbon dioxide, and methane, as well as some organics. Now, the part that had been elusive to it before was the hydrogen. And so let me back off here and pick up a similar model. We have a simulation here of in the Enceladus and the tiger stripes. And so let me fly my spacecraft with the INMS pointed in the direction of motion of the spacecraft through the plume material, sampling the gas. This is how it happened when we were making measurements. It was about eight kilometers above the surface, and this happened in October of 2015. It's interesting to put this together with the other measurements, measurements we'd made of the, diff, of the composition to try to draw some infer, inferences about what's going on in the interior of the ocean, because this material is telling us about composition of the ocean. Well, Hunter, what was going through your head when you looked at the data and you saw hydrogen? Well, of course, we were very excited because we've been planning this for quite a while and we've been thinking about what possible applications might be. So for, to discuss that, let me turn it over to Chris and let him talk a little bit about that. Well, Linda, our team considered numerous possibilities and after performing a detailed geochemical analysis, we found that the best explanation is that the hydrogen is produced by chemical reactions between warm water and rocks. Here's a graphic showing what we think is going on. We think that hydrothermal fluids are circulating below the ocean floor on Enceladus. This exposes rocks to warm water, which drives geochemical transformations. An important process that produces huge amounts of hydrogen is called serpentinization. In this process, certain minerals that are rich in iron react with water to form new minerals, and hydrogen is produced. This is important because it shows that the geochemistry acts on Enceladus. In addition to this, we think that these warm hydrothermal fluids contain dissolved minerals, and when these minerals mix with the ocean water, which is cold, mineral precipitates form at the sea floor. These mineral precipitates on the Earth form white solids, so we call them white smokers. Here's a video showing an example of one of these systems on Enceladus, I mean on the Earth. We don't know if the systems on Enceladus look like this, but this is an example from the Earth. These vents on the Earth support teeming communities of organisms anchored by microbes that feed on chemical energy rather than sunlight. An important reaction at the base of the food chain is called methanogenesis. This is where microbes combine hydrogen with carbon dioxide to make methane, and they get a jolt of energy out of the process. They use this energy to synthesize some of their complex biomolecules, such as sugar molecules. What is intriguing about the data at Enceladus with the hydrogen detection is that we are now able to determine how much energy would be available from the methanogenesis reaction at Enceladus. We have made the first calorie count in an alien ocean. This is a key step towards understanding the habitability of Enceladus. Well, Chris, do you think there could be microbes or even shrimp in the ocean on Enceladus? Well, that'd be wonderful, Linda, but we haven't discovered evidence of organisms on Enceladus, but I'm encouraged by the geochemical data, which could allow for this possibility. Well, thank you very much, Hunter. Thank you, Chris. Well, when Cassini was first built, we never thought we would see an active ocean world like Enceladus at Saturn. So Cassini can look for habitability, but we don't have the instruments to look for life. We've come as far as we can go, so it remains for a future mission to detect life at Enceladus. And the Cassini team is so excited about these new findings. And so, Mary, why don't you put this in a broader context for us? Thank you, Linda. Well, first of all, Chris, I recognize that footage from one of the NASA researchers, Chris German, uh, exploring the East Pacific Rise, which was actually a hydrothermal system very close to the original uh, observation 40 years ago at the Galapagos Rift. 
So while we don't understand it, what the structures would be, and there may be no way for us to tell remotely until we actually get into these oceans, certainly this finding suggests that there's a significant amount of hydrothermal activity to produce such a strong signal of hydrogen. And this hydrogen is a good source of chemical energy to support life. Now what else have we been thinking about that life needs? So I have a figure here to go over sort of the triad of what we need for life. So can I have the figure, please? So of course you know that we need water, and here we are at Ocean Worlds. So we have the water. We need chemical elements that can make the building blocks that go into making cells and provide uh, molecules for metabolism. We need carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, which are down in the lower left of the triangle. And here we get to check off another box. We have found energy to support life. Hydrogen gas provides that energy. Now all we need is to see if Enceladus had enough time or any of the other systems in the Saturnian or Jovian worlds had enough time to evolve life and have life make its imprint on its ocean. So now we have a, a, another observation that kind of connects the worlds and is related um, to what we just heard about, and Jim's going to tell you about this. So indeed, the next discovery we want to talk about, which is also coming out this week in our science journals, is from the Hubble Space Telescope, that famous telescope that just keeps on making wonderful observations, has actually been observing uh, Europa for many years. So let's go to Goddard Space Flight Center and talk to William Sparks. Bill, give us a little background on what we know about Europa. Europa is one of the four major moons of Jupiter. It's about the same size as our own moon, uh, but it looks very different. It's got a smooth, bright, white surface covered in these dark cracks and red patches. The reason for that, and what makes Europa so incredibly interesting, uh, is that it's thought to be engulfed by a global ocean under a thick crust of ice. In fact, it's got twice as much ocean as planet Earth. If we have a salty ocean in contact with a rocky core uh, and energy from a variety of sources, as we just heard from Mary, we have many of the ingredients thought to be necessary for life. <coughs> Your observations from Hubble, what are you now seeing that's important to our understanding of habitability on Europa? In 2014, we used the Hubble and uh, detected evidence of what are probably water vapor plumes emerging from the surface of Europa. That's important because it could be giving us access to subsurface liquid water without having to drill through miles of ice. In 2016, the new observations that we're just publishing, we saw a similar candidate, almost identical in appearance and at the identical location to one of the 2040 candidates. It's very important uh, in an intermittent phenomenon to establish repeatability. It gives us a lot more faith in the observation. The other thing it allows us to do, given the position of Europa, uh, given the position of the candidate on Europa, uh, is to look with more fidelity at that position and see what else we can find there. If we just look at a map of Europa, uh, we don't see anything particularly remarkable at the exact location of the plume candidate shown by the green ellipse. Uh, but if we look back to the Galileo data, uh, Galileo in the 1990s published a thermal image. And right at the peak of the thermal image, uh, that's where the plume candidate is. Uh, this uh, hot spot on the surface of Europa, on the Europa night side, uh, was identified at the time as a thermal anomaly. And it's sitting right on top uh, of the position of our plume candidate. Bill, wow, that's fantastic. Uh, you know, we didn't know when Galileo was flying by Europa how the ocean could possibly communicate with the surface. And now these plumes that Hubble may be observing is giving us that tantalizing glimpse, something exactly what we see on Enceladus may be going on. Can you tell us a little more about how these plumes and that hotspot might relate to each other? Uh, yes, Jim, and it, it's, it's really intriguing. Uh, it was quite astonishing, in fact, just to see the coincidence of the two. Um, but 
it wasn't an accident that we looked for the thermal imaging. Uh, we did it by analogy with an Enceladus, as, as we all know, as you know, and the other people here know. Uh, the plumes of Enceladus are associated with a heat source, and it's a very distinctive signature. And so we looked to see if we could find thermal imaging uh, of the surface of Europa, and we did. And the peak hottest point in the Europa night side was right where our plume candidate is. There's two, like, there's two possible explanations for a, a causal connection. Obviously, coincidences could just occur, but there are reasons to think there could be co a causal relationship. Uh, one possibility is if uh, there's liquid water at a depth below the ice uh, surface, and the liquid water is obviously warmer than the surface. The heat can flow up through the ice and cause a thermal anomaly, and cracks in the ice could give us the plumes. Conversely, uh, the plumes themselves could simply be venting uh, water vapor high into space uh, from the Europa surface. We see plumes rising to 100 kilometers, 60 miles, uh, and we would expect the water vapor to spread out over a much bigger area than that. Uh, we're not at escape velocity, so it's got to come back down. If a fine mist of water vapor rains back down onto the surface, uh, then it can change the thermal character of that surface and allow it to retain heat longer. And so instead of heat coming up from below, it could be heat from above being slowly re-radiated uh, uh, during the Europa nighttime. And so it's a very intriguing pair of results. Uh, we discovered a repeating plume candidate, and when we looked at the Galileo data, we found a position of that repeating plume candidate that uh, was right at the position of a thermal anomaly. Uh, we look forward to the Europa Clipper mission, which Jim is going to tell us about, and uh, that will characterize this and other areas in great detail. You. you know, the Cassini observations at Enceladus and the Hubble observations at Europa tells you, you we're using everything in our arsenal to probe these new ocean worlds that we've discovered. This is truly a really exciting time. Cassini, unfortunately, is near its end. Uh, it will be uh, uh, plunged into the atmosphere of Saturn. It's running out of fuel on the 15th of September. And so these indeed are the last discoveries that we're talking about from Cassini as it relates to Enceladus. The next big mission that we're working on is called the Europa Clipper. And this particular mission is going to Enceladus. It has nine major instruments on it. And these discoveries are coming at just the perfect time. It enables us to make the right set of observations that can tell us much more about these ocean worlds, Europa in particular. Can I have my uh, uh, video, please? The Europa Clipper will orbit Jupiter, but it makes very close flybys of Europa. It has instruments like the magnetometer, once again, that will make measurements of its ocean. It also has an ice-penetrating radar. This radar will tell us how thick or thin these ice shelves are and how close then the ocean might be to cracks. The next major instrument that it has is thermal imaging. Going back to what we learned from Enceladus, how hot are these areas? Are there cracks there like we see now uh, with the plumes from uh, the Hubble observations and the hot spots still uh, being hot from Galileo observations more than 15 or so years ago? In addition to that, we have a UV spectrometer. This imager is going to be the plume finder. So as we go back and orbit out away from Jupiter, we're going to look back at Enceladus. We're going to be looking for those plumes and then diving back in. And hopefully, if everything works right, flying through the plumes, much like Cassini has done uh, at Enceladus. But now we'll have the right set of observations to make. On that spacecraft, the Europa Clipper will have an advanced mass spectrometer. Actually, Hunter Waite is our principal scientist, our principal investigator for that instrument. So what a fantastic time coming up. These observations are really informing us of major things happening in these ocean worlds right now. What I really want you to walk away with is we're pushing the frontiers. We're finding new environments. We're looking in a way that we've never thought possible before for environments in our solar system which may harbor life today. And with that, let me give it back to Felicia. Thanks, Jim. 
Now we're going to go into our Q&A session. For those joining us online, please submit a question using the hashtag AskNASA. For those in the room, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and a mic will be passed to you. And if you're pressed, please state your name and affiliation. So let's start with questions from the room. Okay, well, before we go to questions from the room, let's go ahead to the phone lines. First, we have Camille Carlisle from the Sky and Telescope magazine. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks for taking my call. Two quick questions. One, you mentioned that we essentially have a calorie count now with this hydrogen. Just how much energy is available? Can you put some sort of detail on that? And this is a logistics question. Maybe I missed it. Is there a website for all the, the press images that we can go to and, and get them? So, Felicia, can you tell us the press site? And we'll go to JPL to get the calorie count. So if you want more information about everything we've talked about today, definitely go to www.nasa.gov. Our press release will be on that page, and that will link to additional materials. I believe by going to the JPL Saturn page also, there's materials. So please just go to the two pages that were just on the screen earlier, and you should be able to get the materials you need. And I guess uh, for the second part of the question, let's go to JPL. That's an excellent question. The plume gas mixture from the hydrogen number we derive is equivalent to roughly 300 pizzas per hour in its energy content. Uh, what does that mean? Next, uh, we have on the phone lines, we have Eric Berger from Ars Technica. Hi, thanks very much for having this call. Um, I was questioned about the, the plume evidence, uh, Europa. You said you found it in 2014 and in 2016, this evidence of water plumes. Um, how many times did you look and was it not there? And I guess what I'm trying to get at, is there any sense of how intermittent this plume might be if it does indeed exist? Of course, Bill now has been on the, uh, a number of um, major observations from Hubble, and Bill uh, can give you the answer. Uh, yes, uh, we looked 12 times and we saw it twice in that location. Uh, we did see uh, some evidence of plumes around the South Pole, polar regions a couple of times too, but it's much harder to uh, locate uh, uh, the, the source when you're down at the polar region and there isn't any uh, coverage by Galileo in that region either, so we were, we were lucky to find this one that did repeat was actually near the equator. And so it was uh, twice out of 12 you, times, one in six. Would you care to characterize how confident you are these are actually plumes? Yeah. Uh, the statistics tell us that uh, just from random uh, photon statistics, uh, they're real. Uh, they're what we call four sigma results. Now that's not quite as uh, strong evidence as you'd really like. You, you'd prefer it to be uh, stronger than that because at that level there's always the possibility that there's some sort of instrumental effect that you don't know about. Uh, we've covered our cells in terms of trying to understand what possible instrumental effects could have caused this um, <clears throat> and every single one that we can think of uh, does not appear to be capable of doing it. And so, for example, the two observations that I showed, although they look the same in the same uh, position when we project them on the sky, uh, when they were taken with the camera, the Hubble was in a completely different orientation uh, for those two images. And so they're in completely different parts of the camera uh, with the telescope rolled around at a completely different angle. And that eliminates a, a, a whole bunch of uh, potential systematics that could cause it. So from the Hubble uh, perspective, um, we, we, we're, I wouldn't say, it's not completely unequivocal the way it is with Enceladus. We're still at the limits of what Hubble can do, uh, but we're growing in confidence because of the repeat and because of, uh, in my case at least, with, I, I find the correlation with the uh, Galileo thermal data quite, quite, quite intriguing and quite compelling. You know, from my perspective, uh, as, 
as Bill mentioned, these plumes are uh, up to 50 kilometers and perhaps as high as uh, 100 kilometers. Europa is the size of our own moon. It's an enormous body, and therefore there must be enormous energy to be able to loft these uh, potential water uh, jets uh, high enough for us to be able to observe it five astronomical units away. It's really a remarkable set of observations. Unfortunately, you know, it's not as periodic as the Enceladus plumes, which are on all the time. And so uh, uh, going back to Europa, as Bill has uh, and his team and looked at it periodically, is really giving us the confidence that they're there. They may not be as periodic, but indeed now it looks like the water, the ocean, is communicating with the surface. Bill and his team is also talking about how they can make more observations uh, between now and when we do indeed launch the Europa Clipper in the 2020s. Let's go to the phones. Okay, well, before we go to the phones, let's go ahead to social media where Emily is helping field the questions. So, Emily? Sure, uh, we have a lot of good questions coming in. Uh, this first one is from T. Bettini on Twitter, and she wants to know, are we talking about giant squids or algae and bacteria? <laughs> Mary? <laughs> Um, I think that most of us would be excited with any life, um, yeah. and we're certainly when we're talking about the sources of energy, this is to feed the base of a food web. So we're going to start with bacteria, and if we get lucky, maybe there's something that's larger. You know, I think what's really also exciting about these discoveries is these ocean worlds with, the, with their uh, a protective uh, outer shell, if indeed there's life in there, it it has to be completely different than ours in the sense that it's generated in a way that's not related to our life. We call that a second genesis. Uh, the second question is from at Decent Matt Sai on Twitter, and he wants to know, could there be not movement really, of ice surrounding Enceladus driven by ocean convection currents similar to plate tectonics here on Earth? You know, that's a really great question, and the reason why is it was only within the last couple of years that, they, that we have started to look back at the Europa data uh, that has uh, been gathered by Galileo. You know, Galileo only ma made like uh, 10 or 11 flybys successfully by Europa, and so we have very limited images. But there does appear to be a certain location for which some sort of subduction is going on in a crack where one element or plate of, the, of that uh, uh, icy shell is moving underneath another. We don't know that that's true. It may be in much greater locations all around that, all around that body. But you can understand the stresses when you think about the tidal forces. Europa is in an elliptical orbit uh, around Jupiter, and it also has tidal forces being pushed around by the other Galilean moons. And so when it's close to Jupiter, it gets squeezed. And when it's further away, it relaxes. Every two and a half to three days as it makes its orbit, it is being squeezed and released and squeezed and released. Our estimate today is that the surface moves as much as 30 meters. You know, that's the height of an eight or nine story building every, every two or three days. That heat has got to go somewhere. And, and the pushing and the stresses on, on the icy shell may indeed uh, be like our plate tectonics. Can I add one thing about it that actually is important for life? So here on Earth, many people believe that we wouldn't have sustained life on Earth if it weren't for plate tectonics. So, uh, and so it, that kind of a process is very important on these icy moons as well because we think about uh, we've just heard about some sources of energy that are coming from the interaction of the water and the core. We also think on Europa there are creations of oxidants at the surface as a result of the radiation at the surface. And we need some sort of active shell, uh, a ice tectonics if you will, to actually bring those into contact, much like a battery where you have a positive and a negative pole to actually connect to drive life. And so this process is really important for life. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, we're going to take one more question from social media, and then we're going to go to the phone lines. So, Emily? 
Sure. Uh, this question is from Philip on Facebook, and he wants to know which moon do you think offers more possibility of life on it, Europa or Enceladus? Well, that's uh, a good, good. <laughs> that's a great <laughs> question. I wish I knew for sure. Well, I have, but, a, I have an Oh, answer. all right. Mary, Mary will give her give well, it a shot. Well, so I think that this result of finding um, such a, a significant amount of hydrothermal activity and a lot of hydrogen is incredible. It speaks to the habitability. On the other hand, it also, the fact that we can measure such um, high concentrations of hydrogen and carbon dioxide means that there might not be life there at all. And if there is life, it's not very active because when you have those stacks of pizza, much like in a graduate school department, it disappears. So we have this buildup of food that's not being used. And part of that could be because we think Enceladus might be fairly young. On the other hand, if the same process, which there's no reason to think it wouldn't be happening on Europa, we know that Europa and the moons around Jupiter were formed four billion years ago. So that's a lot more time for life to have emerged and start taking advantage of these energy sources. So my money for the moment um, is still on Europa, uh, but, this, the, the, but it, it could be any, an, on any of these moons. And certainly it would be great if it was on, in all of them. Well, thank you so much. Um, next, we have Mike Wall from space.com from the phone lines. Mike, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Thank you, guys. Um, this is really exciting stuff. And I got another question for actually Bill about the plumes. Um, so, just yeah, just so I'm I'm sort of clear on this, this is not a confirmation that the plumes exist. I mean, I know you guys. I keep seeing more and more signs, but you're but you're stopping short of saying that 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 they definitely exist. And and just so I understand, are these in the same location as, as the original 2012 detection? Or like, do the plumes, I mean, have they been spotted in multiple locations, but all around Europa? Thank you. Yeah, let's have Bill Sparks, of course, answer that. <laughs> okay. Um, it's not completely unequivocal, uh, but in my mind, the pendulum has uh, swung from uh, caution to optimism. Uh, the evidence is growing. The fact that we saw a repeat at the exact same location, uh, that's one of the uh, gold standards for uh, dealing with an intermittent phenomenon. It's not proof because we're right at the limit of what uh, the Hubble can do. Um, it's not completely unequivocal the way uh, it, it is on Enceladus. So on Enceladus you've got movies of the, of the plumes and you've got wonderful maps and uh, temperature maps and mass spectrometer measurements of the composition uh, and, and we've got a little smudge uh, next to an image from the Hubble and you know it's a fantastic image and it's uh, but it's right at the limit of what the Hubble can do. Uh, the fact that we've got a repeat uh, tells you that in a formal statistical sense uh, it can't happen by chance uh, so we have to look for uh, systematic effects that might cause it. We don't know of any which is why uh, most of us, some of us, are, are, are leaning towards thinking that this is, uh, this, this means they're real. Uh, and then the secondary information with the uh, thermal imaging, uh, since I went to look for the thermal imaging, uh, that uh, gives you some additional statistical evidence that in fact they're, uh, they're real. Uh, it doesn't prove it because, you know, unfortunate coincidences can happen in the world. In terms of the location, uh, the original uh, detection by the Roth team was ar around the South Polar region. Uh, th these are the uh, dissociation products of water uh, in high, at high altitude uh, down around the South Pole. And uh, in our uh, transit observations where we were looking for absorbing material around Europa, uh, we did see uh, a couple of, uh, uh, of, of, of features in that in, in that area, uh, but it's harder to localize things around the poles. Uh, this particular one uh, was well localized. It wasn't quite as high as the previous one, and that's the one that repeated, and so that's really quite quite interesting. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple other pieces of evidence that I think is also really tantalizing. You know, when we look in Enceladus, particularly around those tiger straps, there's absolutely no craters. They're completely filled in. As you go to uh, the mid-latitudes and up to the uh, North Pole of Enceladus, you, see, you do indeed see a number of craters. 
If we look now at Europa, we can hardly see any craters. This has always been a big puzzle in terms of how this surface is morphing, eliminating the craters that must have been there at one time and are continually uh, bombarding the body. But over the length of time that we've observed it with the Galileo mission, that was several years, only a handful of craters were found. The plumes, the plume idea that it is resurfacing and the subduction uh, must be connected in a way that is eliminating those craters. So this fits perfectly with these observations. I think it's a Zamboni. <laughs> So um, next, uh, we have two questions on the phone line. Then we're going to go ahead and go to social media. So the first uh, call-in person we have is Keith Cowing from NASA Watch. Keith? Uh, Two-part question for Thomas uh, Brookin. First of all, uh, several years ago, NASA was directed to create an Ocean Worlds program. Now, I see that phrase everywhere, but have you formally established a program office? Is, who's in charge of it? What's the budget? And second of all, a question, um, why is it that some news media were given advance access to NASA personnel uh, on the, this taxpayer-funded research and others of us were not? So uh, let me certainly take uh, on the first one as head of planetary science, and we did indeed receive congressional direction about establishing uh, an Ocean Worlds program. Uh, we have indeed communicated uh, back to Congress uh, in our budgetary aspects that we are uh, doing that in, in, with respect to uh, the next set of missions. And that next set is indeed the Europa Clipper mission. Uh, as far as um, uh, the press interaction, that's, well, that's done in another way. So we've also were directed to establish a program for investigating ocean worlds, and we went to our Outer Planets Assessment Group and uh, asked them to help us out by developing a roadmap for exploring these worlds. And that is in, pro uh, in process. They're about to deliver to that to us any day now, uh, or any month now, week. Um, and so we're moving forward on setting the science, as we always do, setting the science priorities, and then filling in the technologies that we're going to need for it and, and, and discussing the types of missions those would look like to the various ocean worlds that we have to explore. Next, we have Tracy Watson from USA Today. Tracy? Hi, thank you for Dr. Green. Can you talk about now how this mission affects your desire to send, excuse me, how these results affect your desire to send a mission to Enceladus? Does this make it kind of rise to the top of what should be next? Thanks. Well, indeed, we announced in January uh, a program called New Frontiers. And that is a very targeted list of, of, of objects. And on that list turns out to be Enceladus. This is an element, indeed, of recognition that this is an active world, that this is new discoveries that have been made uh, by Cassini since the time our planetary decadal actually identified what those targets are. So uh, that's in competition right now, and, and we'll be receiving the proposals uh, soon, and we'll be evaluating them and announcing the, the, uh, the step one selectees by the end of the calendar year is what we hope. Thanks, Jim. Uh, next, we're going to go to social media. So, Emily, what are uh, the netizens talking about today? Yeah, there's a lot of interest on social media. Um, this question is from Lorenzo on Facebook. So the Juno spacecraft just recently went into orbit around Jupiter. Is there any possibility for that spacecraft to help with um, observations of the plumes around Europa? Well, indeed, um, uh, Juno was launched in 2011. And we may have had a hint of the plumes, of course, from Cassini, but absolutely nothing from uh, Europa by that time. And so it's concentrating on really orbiting uh, Jupiter and understanding the structure of that large uh, planet, you know, the largest planet in our solar system. It also is uh, uh, so important to understand that because the, the remnants uh, left over after Jupiter and Sun accreted was the rest of the solar system. So we're really, really quite interested in understanding the origin and evolution of our solar system and understanding how Jupiter was put together is a major segment of that. So unfortunately, no Europa observations. 
All right, this next one is from Carrie on Facebook. Uh, they want to know what chemicals are causing the coloration around the cracks on Europa? So with that, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Goddard could talk a little bit about that. Bill? Uh, I think the short answer is we don't know. Uh, there, there are suspicions that there are salts from the ocean, but it's not known what sort of salts, and that potentially there's a contribution from uh, the Jovian magnetosphere of sulfur ions being implanted from Io, the next moon in, that's definitely uh, got plumes. It's got sulfur volcanoes uh, spraying sulfur into the whole environment. Uh, but the detailed composition uh, of the cracks and the dark areas, it's, a, it's an ongoing study uh, for, of research. Uh, people are trying to find out. It's obviously a very interesting question. And, uh, it, 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 it will be very nice to know the answer to that. All right, we'll take one more question from social media. Emily? Awesome. Uh, this one's from Stephanie on Twitter. She wants to know what instruments would be needed to detect life on Enceladus and how can we help? Okay, uh, with that, let's go to JPL. All right, um, well, the instrument, excuse me, the instrumentation that uh, would be, uh, could be useful in this regard are similar instruments to the ones that we were flying on Cassini. They're, uh, and they're certainly similar to the instruments that are presently flying on Europa. The mass spectrometer and uh, dust analyzer um, are both important in determining the habitability, as well as looking for perhaps amino acids, fatty acids, uh, looking at isotopic ratios and trying to determine uh, if signs of life as well as telling us more about the habitability. Learning a little bit about the structure of the molecules themselves would also be beneficial. And that can be done through tandem mass spectrometry. Um, there are certainly other techniques that are being studied for landers, but for fly-through missions, which we think would be uh, good enough in the case of Enceladus, uh, this is the this is a, a, a next step that would be a good a good approach. Well, thank you. Now, so before we close, um, Jim, can you give us some closing thoughts? Um, anything you'd like to talk about? Indeed, um, you know this is really an exciting time. Our science is proceeding so rapidly; we can hardly keep up with these discoveries. You know, uh, we really are looking forward to more of the Hubble observations. Uh, we may find that Europa is far more active in terms of not only one location, but a number of locations. And that bodes well with, as I mentioned earlier, filling in these craters. These ocean worlds have just been discovered. They are in our solar system. We need to probe them because they are one of the best locations we believe that may harbor life today. Thank you. And that's all the time that we have left. Please keep those questions coming online using the hashtag AskNASA. Before, be sure to follow us on all our social media. And for more information, please visit www.nasa.gov as well as other websites.